oriented, and yet you pay Mandy and a million dollars and they come out and say they're sophisticated. So um, that's one. The talk about security awareness, where I think I have one called Seven Habits of Security Awareness that goes through things. I probably would include gamification in it just because you know, it gets boring just talking about seven habits. You know, it's a nice title because it's funny, but otherwise. Um, I could also give a presentation, actually thre incorporate threat intelligence into security awareness programs. That's another one that I uh, just recently gave. And um, I'll take suggestions also if there's, what's an, oh yeah, the phishing kill chain, where I talk about phishing messages, because really most people think phishing, oh, that's a stupid human trick. But really, when you look at it, for a phishing message to be successful, there's at least 10 layers of points of attack that could have been stopped proactively, and only two of the 10 layers actually has anything to do with the user, because technology should kind of kick in as well. I could talk about the Syrian Electronic Army and why they hate me, and why I keep screwing with them and stuff like that. So I could do that one. Um, and that's a little bit. Um, Okay, so I, I pretty much covered them. So does anybody have, of those, is there, so, let's see, sophisticated attack myth, raise your hands. Okay, about a third of the audience. Um, seven habits of security programs or gamification or awareness programs? Uh, <laughs> frankly, there's two votes and I think one was a sympathy vote for you, Jen, so give Steve a thumbs up on that one. Um, <laughs> I have the Syrian Electronic Army. Any for those? AI. Uh, I'm not going to do AI. I'm not a fool. Um, <laughs> but uh, let's see. What was the other one I said? Uh, what? Threat Intel. Threat Intel and incorporate into security awareness programs. Okay. Well, see, you just lost Steve's sympathy vote on that one. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, let's do this. I will. Okay, we're going to talk about, okay, so it seems like the sophisticated attack myth had the most votes. Most other people just don't seem to give a damn, so that's probably the other part of it. So I'll go over the sophisticated attack myth, and I'll talk to you about threat intel afterwards. You'll get a private briefing along with Steve. If, um, how's that? So let me see if I actually have these presentations ready. Here, hold on. Installing malware. person who was interested in threat intel, that's, she's voting with her feet. Um, so, yeah, anyway, um, okay, let's talk about this, and let's see, there were, are there any kids here, so I toned down my language, uh, I, I'm normally from Brooklyn, and if somebody calls somebody a bastard, that's like an ex term of endearment, just to start out with, so, um, anyway, I'm trying to tone it down anyway, this is Iowa. I think. I don't even know where I am anymore. You know Iowa. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the sophisticated attack myth. Basically, what's going on is every time there's an attack out there, somebody comes out and says, oh my god, this was such a sophisticated attack, we could have never stopped it. I was actually at a, um, earlier this week, or I don't even know, it might have been yesterday, I was at a conference in Los Angeles, the ISC Squared conference, and there was a keynote panel and it had Howard Schmidt, like former cybersecurity advisor, and he was like the chair of the panel, and then they had like the chief security officers of like Electronic Arts and a lot of other media companies out there. 
And what all these people were saying is like, somebody said, yeah, Sony, that was an unpreventable attack. And I was like ready to wring their necks. You know, I'm like sitting there, it's like, what do you mean it's an un, you know, it's unpreventable? You know, and then like, so luckily Howard knew me, saw me raise my hand, I go, how dare you say that thing was unpreventable? You know, they had no multi-factor authentication, they, had this, they didn't have this, they didn't have that, they didn't have this, they didn't have that, they were clueless. And the guy's like, well, what I meant was, well, maybe if they kept coming after them and stuff, you know, eventually they would have gone in. And I'm like, uh, I'm no, sorry, I'll be, I just would like ready to blurt out manure, you know, it's like a bar, Iowa. But, um, so, there I am sitting there thinking, it's like, that was not an unpreventable attack event, you know, that was not an attack that would have been successful eventually. You know, because if it was successful eventually, it means you have a stagnant security program that's completely clueless and all that sort of stuff. So, I mean, in my opinion, every time they pay Mandy a million dollars to come out and say it was a sophisticated attack, it really means they had a clueless program in place to prevent such attacks. And the thing is, it's like there's media hype and all that sort of stuff. So anyway, I'll probably find something else to rant about in another slide. Okay, so let's talk about cyber warfare for dummies, the way I phrase this. Why is this? The media loves a good story. You know, and the security, you know, security keeps giving it to them. I mean, when you're out there looking at what they're doing, it's like, well, gee, why is this one, you know, why is this in the news and everything like that? Just out of curiosity, I'll come back to this one later. How many people ever heard of the J.P. Morgan credit card attack? J.P. Morgan Chase? Okay, a couple people in the security profession heard about that. 70 million credit cards were stolen just about the same time as a whole bunch of other breaches. Nobody ever heard of that. Why did nobody ever hear of that, even though 70 million credit cards? That's because J.P. Morgan came out and said, we screwed up. We didn't have multi-factor authentication in place. If there was multi-factor authentication in place, it would have never been successful. And what happened? All of a sudden, the news media is like, oh, this isn't a good story. But then the Sony hack occurred, I give or take, about the same time. And everybody's like, oh, it's the North Koreans, this is terrible, and all that sort of stuff. You know, nobody says, like, well, gee, it was like the Israeli hackers who took, stole 70 million credit cards. But it's like, no, this is terrible. That was a sophisticated attack. This other one, it was nothing. But this one was sophisticated. You know, they use the same methods, but that one was sophisticated. It was ridiculous. We love to give them good stories. And there's too much out there. Because what did J.P. Morgan do? J.P. Morgan took out the whole who. But Sony had the who. You know, Sony had the who. Sony led with the who. There was arguments about the who. It wasn't about the how. It was all about the who. Every day, nobody cared that basically somebody fished the password. They had really, 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 bad, really, really bad security in place. They, you know, you talk about Target, and it was like, wow, well, you know, these must be Russian credit card hackers and all that. You know, it's, it's, it's the Russians, you know, it's like the Cold War all over, but now it's the Cyber War. It's the Cyber Cold War, but now we're stealing credit cards. And everybody was horrified by this whole thing. But the media feeds it, the security people love to do it. You know, they, we love to jump on and give them the story because we don't like to say, you know what, at the end of the day, I think we're clueless, but that's a separate issue. So now, why this matters to us? When we're here as security professionals, everybody's out there thinking, you know, it's, it's like, what's our job as security people? The job is to prevent attacks. The job is to mitigate attacks. The job is to go ahead and do this. But on the other hand, if, if we hear it's a sophisticated attack, everybody's losing complete focus on how and why these things were accomplished. Because how many people ever heard, you know, the story of the Sony hack, how many people ever said, oh, this, oh, let me give you a better one, Heartbleed. Heartbleed. You know, everybody would say the whole fabric of the internet was ruined because of the Heartbleed vulnerability. And it's like almost every website in the world has, you know, the Heartbleed vulnerability. It's like, be afraid your credit cards are going to be stolen, your passwords are going to be stolen. If you had any traffic over the last two years, now anybody could go back, look at that data, and then figure out what your passwords were and then steal everything. And I'm like sitting there thinking, how many people are collecting every bit of data in the last two years that somebody's actually going to sit there and like they have a database of every bit on the internet in the last two years to now go back and replay? That is the most moronic concern I've ever heard. 
It's kind of like, I think the person was from Iowa, like right after September 11th, there was the anthrax thing, and somebody duct tape, uh, uh, what is it called, like cellophane all around their house. I mean, he must have been from Iowa. I said, but he like duct tape because he was afraid that there was going to be a chemical warfare attack. And what the guy do? He's like, I'm going to protect my house from anthrax. So he pretty much covered his house, the whole thing. It was in the news, duct tape and everything. The guy was more infinitely more likely to get carbon monoxide poisoning then be hit by anthrax spread somehow that was so dispersed, there's more anthrax in the ground than would have ever hit his house. That's how bad things were. But again, everybody loves these conspiracies and all this, but then the question is, why does it matter? It matters to us because we're there answering stupid questions instead of saying, you know what, there's a lot of lessons to be learned. Multi-factor authentication, we needed to do this. In Hartley, I was hoping that somehow they would make all those news stories useful, front page news stories, press. What do they say? Fabric of the internet. Um, by the way, change your password, you'll be okay. How many people ever said that? How many people told the end users, by the way, you can't do anything about it, but change your password and you'll be fine? You know, nobody. It was too important to say the fabric of the internet was broken instead of saying, oh, by the way, good idea to change your password on a periodic basis. So anyway, everybody loves to paint the picture of an unstoppable enemy versus bad security. It's easy because now instead of people from Sony being strung up by their proverbial genitals, um, what happened? Everybody was out there, oh, sophisticated, it was North Korea, oh, North Korea, those are evil people, right? It's like, no, those North Koreans were just kind of doofuses that had nothing better to do with their time. But we made it easy for them. And then other organizations are like, well, if North Korea is attacking companies like Sony, if Target's losing hundreds of millions of credit cards, what are we going to do? We don't have the budget to do anything like that and fight these people, so we'll just continue to do absolutely nothing and be the next victim. Because that was one of the things I actually said to the guy at Sony, you know, like the guy who stood up and said the Sony hack was unpreventable. I'm sitting there and my exact quote was, you know what, when I hear you say the Sony hack was unpreventable, that's like saying, well, I pretty much expect to be screwed in six months, but I don't want to be blamed for it. So if I say the Sony hack was unpreventable, the attack against my company will be unpreventable preventable as well. So here's the thing. What I'm trying to get at is every time you hear sophisticated attack, you should be thinking, wait a second, 99% to 99 actually 0.99% of the time, it's not a sophisticated attack. You should be thinking somebody really screwed up on their security program. You should be thinking that somebody completely failed to implement basic precautions if they were hit by a quote-unquote sophisticated attack. And what is a sophisticated attack? You know, what is it like somebody goes ahead, scans your network and says, oh, I didn't get in by a scan, let me try a phishing message. Oh, well, I got a phishing message, now, oh, let me log in. Oh, this is a low-level user. Let me, oh, there's a vulnerability, let me elevate my privilege. Oh, I just threw out three different attacks. Those are all, that must mean I'm sophisticated. You know, that's essentially, what is a sophisticated attack? And frankly, you're going to hear about the IRARI rules in a little bit, but the problem is people get away with calling it an unsophisticated because for some reason, if you pay Mandy into a million dollars, they will proclaim it sophisticated under some unknown, got under some unknown criteria. But again, if you hear sophisticated, if you have to pay somebody a million dollars to come out in the news and say it was a sophisticated attack, odds are you're paying for security after, well, you're paying for um, damage <coughs> PR after the fact than you are were paying for your security to begin with. Okay, let's talk about the proclaimed sophisticated attacks. You know, the recent ones out there, obviously there was Sony, I'm going to talk about that a bit. You have Target, again, that guy was really, really sophisticated because he, he did phishing and he also went through an unsophisticated network security and then, by God, he downloaded lots of data. That's really sophisticated. Then you had the U.S. Central Command, you know, sent, you know that was an ISIS attack. Then you had TV5 Mond, which is a French TV station. They were attacked by ISIS, and again, and the world was devastated. It was an attack on freedom of speech because I'll give you a little, sorry, I'll give you a spoiler alert. They put their passwords on TV. Not a good idea. You know, I, I can't imagine that I have to actually say, 
don't put your passwords on TV, you know, as, as a security measure. You know, I mean, I mean, seriously, it's like embar I mean, honestly, I am sitting here embarrassed that I have to actually say half the things I'm going to be saying. And I don't get embarrassed about anything. I mean, I'm, a, I'm actually embarrassed for, I don't know, I'm not embarrassed, who am I kidding? Anyway, so then you got the IRS. The IRS was another one everybody was going to say, you know, I'll go through the quotes later or else I'll never get through. I'll have a, my head will explode if I keep this up. Anyway, but you name it, according to somebody, it was a sophisticated attack. Why? Well, it's sophisticated because we had really crappy security. Um, here's another thing. It can also turn around and help you. When you're sitting there going ahead and trying to justify your security programs, there are so many different things you could do. All this news is great. I mean, frankly, the CEO of Target was fired. I still have no idea why the CEO of Target was fired, but their chief information security officer who said, ignore all that fire eye data, it's a new thing, don't worry about it. I mean, that, that person really should be the should be strung out to dry by everybody. You know, but you can use the whole the narrative to help your cause. It's like, look, we can help you not lose your job, you know, your ten million dollar a year job if you let me have a good security program. We can help you keep, you know, the company up and running. We can help keep you out of the news. Because I hate to say it for the most part, but a lot of your jobs are to keep your company out of the news. You know, and most of the time, because let's face it, and I'll, I'll cover this this way, there is no such thing as perfect security. Anybody that ever tells you there's perfect security is a fool or a liar, or some combination of both. Or they think you're a, a or, or they think you're a fool, which is very much. Well, I guess that makes them a liar, but either way, it's the same thing. So, if you highlight the common vulnerabilities and say, look, here's all these attacks, and the fact of the matter is, all these attacks could have been completely prevented with these security measures in place, but now, I need these security measures so we don't have the same attack everybody else did. And frankly, a lot of you probably don't have that type of security that I'm going to cover in a little bit. And it's embarrassing you don't. But the reason I'm hoping you don't is not because you don't think you need it, but because you don't get the budget or support to actually implement it. And that's a critical thing to put together. So again, it might be it'll help you get funding and a whole bunch of other stuff. And you know, maybe by telling people that actually, even if you have the things in place, you can go and say, look, we put these things in place, and now because we put these things in place, we would have stopped those attacks. So we have a program that's worthy of you saying, I did a good job. Uh, okay, so let's look at Target. How did Target happen? Um, Target, they essentially went through and it all began with a phishing message. I'm sure it began with other things, but basically it happened with a phishing message where somebody sent a phishing email to one of their vendors who had access to the vendor network. The vendor network essentially allows vendors to go ahead and send invoices through, say where's the status of payments and stuff like that. So they went ahead, sent a message to the vendor, you know, somebody sent a phishing message, got the user credentials for the phishing, you know, for the vendor. They logged on as the vendor, then they went ahead and had low level access, and then they fished around, or I shouldn't say fish, that has a bad kind of, they basically did reconnaissance, I'll use, I don't want to use reconnaissance, it sounds too sophisticated, but they did reconnaissance on the network and found the network was a completely flat network with no segmentation, or if there was segmentation, it was so pathetic that it was trivial to break through. Then after they broke through that, they went ahead and found the configuration management servers. In other words, the servers that you install software on that push out software updates to systems all over the place. You know, lots of companies have these configuration management stuff, and they're really good things. But what did they do? These configuration management systems, which are so critical, basically had no protection on them whatsoever, so based, the criminal installed some malware onto the configuration management server, and they let Target's network push out the malware to all the point of sale systems. Simultaneously, they found a lot of servers that were vulnerable. They went ahead and said, oh, well, I'm not just going to hack credit cards from point-of-sale systems. I'm going to download the Target customer database with all their stored credit cards, like the Target red cards. I don't know how many people realize this, but Target is actually possibly the largest credit card company in the world because they issue their own Target red cards. 
And that's a big thing that most people don't realize. So they're like, in many cases, a bigger credit card issuer than Citi. Well, no, that might be an exaggeration. But they're a bigger credit card issuer than just about every other bank out there. And they self-fund it, which meant when Target has to go ahead and report numbers, they're reporting losses against their own systems, which is kind of embarrassing, or even worse. Actually, or even better, because they're not going to have a class action suit against themselves, I guess. So anyway, the criminal war is able to download all that massive data and go ahead. Then after the criminal downloaded the massive data, the next thing that happened was, uh, oh sorry, they put it onto exfiltration servers. In other words, those are servers inside the victim company that you store all the data in that you steal. Because theoretically, a smart criminal, and it's not a sophisticated, it's just a reasonably intelligent criminal says, I am gonna go ahead and steal a lot of data over time. But if I keep sending a lot of data out randomly, Somebody, if they had a reasonable security program, which apparently Target didn't, they might see all this random data go out and then they could track it back. So I'm just going to put the data on their internal systems and then at a point in time on this exfiltration server, then I'm going to exfiltrate all the data out at a given point in time and it'll just be one massive download that they won't know would hit them and, it'll just, and that's essentially what happened with Target. So anyway, they, of course they went undetected except for the fact that supposedly there was a FireEye system newly installed in place and the newly installed FireEye system was completely ignored and the CISO at the time said, oh, it's a new system, don't worry about it. Um, anyway, and she's apparently still there. So sophisticated, were the attackers disciplined? The attacker or, well, attacker very possibly could have been a kid in the basement. The reality was probably a Russian criminal from whatever people think. Might have been one person, might have been a couple people. The attacker was disciplined. And let's face it, how much time did this attack take from start to finish? If you look at the timeline on Brian Kre on Krebs Online, about two or three months. How, the guy made millions of dollars. How many of you would invest two or three months of your time just to steal a million dollars? I mean, yeah. Sorry, the students in the place want to, you know, I, screw that degree. <laughs> I'm going to my basement. Um, so anyway, there people are, somebody in their basement in probably Russia or somewhere else, went ahead, took two or three hours of their, t well, two or three months of their time to go ahead and probably fishing around other networks as well, basically established the whole thing. Were they, you know, disciplined? Were they persistent? In other words, did they say, oh, gee, I had 100,000 phishing messages and only five people clicked on it. What a failure. Yeah, I mean, no, they were persistent. They might have got stopped a few times. They went ahead, did research, and went ahead and did all that other stuff. Was it sophisticated? Hell no, it was not sophisticated. Network monitoring tools were ignored. Phishing messages were, should have been expected. On top of that, there's no network segmentation. Of course, an HVAC vendor, you know, um, whatever, what a, you know, air conditioning controls and stuff, for those of you that don't, I don't even know what HVAC stands for. Heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, maybe? Oh, I got it right. Anyway, um, so anyway, the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning vendor, you know, was somehow compromised. It's expected, you know, that's going to happen. Then, no whitelisting on point of sale systems. In other words, even though the configuration management systems were compromised, they still should have, once it, got, once it hit the point of sale systems, it is industry standard practice on point of sale systems like whitelist. In other words, you basically go ahead and say, is this software allowed to run? Because a point of sale system has a very, very small piece of software, you know, very small software set that should run. And it says, is this one of the very few allowed software? It's like, no, it's not. Should have not even got on board. So anyway, Target failed on that. And again, the recent Krebs update to the thing, you know, with the Verizon thing, they had really bad security all over the place. So anyway, was it sophisticated? No. Could the attacker might have been sophisticated? He didn't have to be sophisticated. And that's what's the most embarrassing part. This could have been the most met brilliant computer hacker in the world. And it was completely unnecessary because I promise you, these two people, I don't, I don't know who they are, maybe you should watch them, but these two people could have done the exact same thing given enough time. I think it was them. Oh. <laughs> yeah, but anyway. So now let's talk about Sony. The attackers were North Korean. Anybody who wants to argue North Korea, get a life, get over it. It was North Korea. It's a given by now. It was North Korea. Get over it. 
The thing is, how did it begin? It was a spear phishing attack according to the news sources that what happened was, how many of you have iPhones or Macs or something like that, you know, the, like the systems nobody uses even in, I think, well, if you, I mean, nobody has one, yeah, right. So anyway, um, everybody's like, if I raise my hand, I'm going to go to jail. So, um, but basically, everybody has an I, you know, everybody who has one has to have an Apple ID. So what these attackers did was they went ahead, they probably went through LinkedIn, identified who administ likely administrators were for Sony, went through online sources, figured out who the administrators were, sent phishing messages that said, we need to confirm your Apple ID. The, the administrators replied back to it. They apparently reused their personal password on the Apple ID as their administrator passwords. No multi-factor authentication. Gave the attackers a foothold on the network. Once they had the foothold on the network, completely flat network, so they could go anywhere they wanted. They could get on mail servers, they could exploit known vulnerabilities. Again, if you have a completely flat network, you could probably safely assume that the security on the systems was really, really bad. So they went ahead and did that, and that was all that. So then they went ahead, they downloaded email, they downloaded thing, no data leak prevention was on the network to stop the stuff from coming off. And then they got access to the movie servers, downloaded all the movies and everything like that. And that was life. Then they went ahead and destroyed Matt and they sent malware, you know, they used, you know, Sony likewise had a configuration management system where they installed um, the malware onto the system that pushed out the malware to all the PCs in the organization. And then the malware, you know, at some point in time, a time bomb went off and said, you know, all these systems are now pretty much bricks. And however, what really happened at the end of the day was, um, the malware, well actually let me go to the next slide. Um, okay, so was the attack sophisticated? Was the, was the attack, you know, the attackers were again fairly disciplined. They're a bunch of idiots. I mean, I don't know if you saw like taunting the FBI. I mean, at that point you really have some pride, people. I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean, it like made them look like buffoons, which is even worse. There were a whole bunch of buffoons that caused all that damage to Sony. And so anyway, but they still paid Mandian like a million dollars to come out and say it was a sophisticated attack. Then they had enough political clout to get the FBI come out and say it was a sophisticated attack. Oh no, actually, here was the best quote. The FBI said 90% of companies would have also failed to stop the attack. That tells me that the FBI thinks 90% of corporate security programs out there are completely clueless. And only 10% have better than nothing security programs. So anyway, the attackers were very good at getting into the network, getting on. Sophisticated, hell no. The malware use should have been detected. How many people heard of the Dark Soul attacks that happened like about a year or so ago? Wow, that's scary. Okay, so a couple people. Dark Soul was essentially North Korea attacking South Korean and some US and Canadian banks. The same malware was used in the Dark Soul attacks that was used at the Sony attacks. Same IP addresses, same command and control servers were used. All those things should have been blacklisted. The malware should have been built right into, you know, any antivirus or anti-malware program should have been able to detect that malware installed on systems before it had the opportunity to run. Then, no multi-factor authentication. They had no, you know, in other words, whether it was like, you know, um, token IDs like RSA secure ID cards or whether it was like, you know, one-time passwords like log into your Google account that get a text or something. No multi-factor authentication. If there was any multi-factor authentication, like there should be on at least administrative accounts, the, the attackers wouldn't have got anywhere. Likewise, Sony's most valuable intellectual property are their new movies. I mean, even if it's not for these people, you know, these idiots from North Korea, it could have at least been to stop the movies from being downloaded so it could be burned in pure detail onto DVDs and sold like a you know, better quality movie than you buy in the store. So, you know, there were so many things. So no multi-factor authentication. The passwords were static enough so that what happened was, you know, they could embed the passwords in the Dark Soul malware. That's really, really bad. When you can embed passwords into malware, it means you're confident they're not going to change those passwords. So anyway, I, I mean, I once I gave this similar presentation with um, Ari at RSA, and this woman came up to me afterwards, and you can tell it's like she had a big smile on her face, but it was one of those smiles that is like, I want to strangle you. So anyway, it's like, you know, it's like, would you like to hear what really happened at Sony? I go, I would, and she's like, well, you're, you're all wrong about it. I'm like, well, did you have multi-factor? 
we did we have multi-factor I go well apparently not on the right systems well that's what I was thinking because you know anymore I could tell she was really ready to strangle me and she's like we, we, we change our passwords and I'm like okay and I'm thinking apparently not frequently enough you know we have strong network segmentation it's like uh, yeah I'm like uh, not really Kind of like the whole thing was, there's a Fortune magazine article that went into detail, so I kind of went back to the guy who wrote the article just to confirm. So every all of my defamation against Sony is actually true, so it's not technically defamation. So anyway, um, uh, let's, okay, so let's talk about, um, is that Sony? Yeah. Okay, so now let's talk about Suncom on TV5. This was horrifying to the world. What happened? ISIS took over the central, central, U.S. Central Command's YouTube and Twitter feeds. You know, it was horrifying. Everybody was like, they took over, you know, sent, they attacked, successfully attacked the U.S. Central Command, which is in charge of, like, the Middle East region. And everybody's like, oh, my God, it's like, we cannot defend against ISIS. They're hacking our infrastructure. It's like it's YouTube and Twitter. Get over it. People don't realize what it is. It's really easy. I mean, again, what's protecting these accounts? A password. What's your Twitter, you know, what is the ID for the... Twitter handle. You know, it's actually the ID that's publicly available. The password was probably shared, reused, or guessable because it's not controlled by one person, it's probably controlled by a team of people, so they probably share the password. Likewise, YouTube passwords. Again, get over it. You know, yes, they went ahead, they, they hacked the Central Command YouTube and Twitter, and Twitter accounts and put up ISIS propaganda in its place. The YouTube and Twitter, I hope really hope are so useless to central command that it's almost a joke it's like we have those accounts but anyway but no the, this made major news things then there was tv5 mod tv5 mod was ba uh, i don't know how to pronounce it somebody who knows french might but you know it's like tv5 world so what happened was they went ahead took down it they took down the satellite feeds and did a whole bunch of other stuff French politicians were saying were declaring this atta an attack on free speech because a major French TV station was taken down, which even the French people probably said thank you about. <laughs> and then what happened though? All of a sudden, these people were like, you know, then as everybody researched it, and you could find the picture. There's actually somebody on TV5 Mon. They were interviewing somebody in the studio, like you know, like had a microphone like me, like this, and then behind me would be a whiteboard with like passwords written down. And it was almost like yeah. written down lie YouTube password. Yeah, something like that. Except, you know, that's... <laughs> I mean, frankly, that's okay. I'm wondering who really cares about such a complicated password for a public Wi-Fi? You know, put password down. How hard are you trying to fight this thing? <laughs> anyway. You know, I mean, seriously, part of security is availability. You want to have the data available, like, you know, I mean, it's like, it's like, it's like hacking through security, you know, or like denial of service through security. So anyway, but going back to this thing, they went ahead and like almost the password was like la YouTube password, you know, and like I wonder what their Twitter password would be, la Twitter password, you know, and it's like what would their la satellite password, you know, I mean, these people were morons. And yet, they were declaring an attack against free speech, and frankly, it's an attack against the dignity of any security professional, that these vulnerabilities were allowed to exist. But anyway, so, okay, I think I pretty much covered that slide, but you know, it took a little, probably a little bit of work, maybe they used phishing or whatever, nobody really knows what it was, but again, it doesn't matter. Do I really have to say, don't put your password on TV? I mean, that's like an embarrassment for me to Nobody in a security conference would say, do not put your password on TV as a viable security. Well, I mean, that's like, you know, I used to say, you can't have common sense without common knowledge. And the problem with most security awareness programs is they assume common knowledge. But I swear, if you don't, there, you know, this comes under the category of, you know, there's no such thing as a stupid question or whatever. There's not, you know, there's no such thing as a stupid user. Anybody who writes down a password and puts it on TV is a complete ignoramus. Um, okay, so now we have the IRS breach. Um, so the IRS breach, 104,000 records were compromised through it. Well, actually, that, the number was updated since I did this. 200,000 records were compromised through um, the IRS get transcript function as a heads up. 
200,000. What did these things do? Because I'm going to cover this in detail. And then they said there were 200,000 attempted breaches. Now it looks like there were 400,000 attempted breaches. That because those numbers become important. So they compromised the authentication scheme. Um, oh yeah, and it required, according to the IRS commissioner, it required information only that it should be only the taxpayer had. Well, obviously, the criminals had it if they were able to authenticate. So there's something there. You know, the criminals downloaded records. The IRS commissioner said it couldn't be stopped citing that the attack was committed by smart criminals with lots of advanced computers who hire smart people. Now, thinking about this, does the IRS purposefully hire stupid people? You know, I mean, if I work for the IRS, I would send a nasty gram to the commissioner of the IRS. I mean, very seriously, you got to stop and think, what the hell is going on there? You know, like, what do these people, what do the criminals actually do? The criminals got on, they basically said, oh, here's a function, oh, and by the way, they stole $50 million in the process. Yeah, and how they did this was, the IRS had a function on the internet that basically said, um, so they had the function on the internet that basically said, if you want copies of your records, you know, get your transcripts of whatever, of your last year's tax records, please come onto the internet and enter the following information to prove your identity. They used an Experion service. Does anybody know who Experion is? Uh, yeah, so, in, if you have T-Mobile, yeah, you do yeah. now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So Experion is a credit reporting agency. One function that they offer is for remote verification. So if you've ever had to apply for a credit card and they want to confirm your identity, they ask you questions that are literally from your credit report. And they say something to the effect along the lines of, um, so they say something to the effect along the lines of, how, um, how much do you pay for rent? Zero to five hundred dollars, five hundred to like five thousand dollars, five thousand and above. You know how many people can't get that right? Do you live on? You know, have, which address was previously associated with you? First Avenue, Main Street, um, Second Avenue, or Shard House Road, or something like that? Something really obscure. And it's like, of course, it's something really obscure. But they ask these stupid questions. And those questions are how you authenticate, right off your credit report. Now, if you have a copy of somebody's credit report, which I promise you, you can go out and buy for $25, or, well, no, I think it's $39 now, but probably you could go to the dark web and get it cheaper, you can go ahead and download people's credit reports. So somehow, the criminals had at least 400,000 credit reports that they were then able to attempt to compromise, and then 200,000 of them, they were able to answer the challenge questions based on the information that they had. That's how they went ahead and did that. Was that a sophisticated attack? You know something? No. I mean, again, what did it take? The criminals, all they needed was the credit reports, the IRS to use the commercial system, and clearly, anybody with access to the commercial system could have gone ahead and done that. They went undetected for 400,000 relatively intense, intensive attempts. Let me ask you this question. If you see 400,000 uh, attempts to download people's credit reports from a given IP address in Russia, does, it, or are you sitting there thinking, gee, we had a whole, a whole lot of American citizens move to Russia and live in a really big apartment building. You know, I mean, literally, where's the intrusion detection? Because let me actually talk about this. Well, and I'll, I think I have a slide on this, but I'll cover this now. Was this attack preventable? You know something? In all honesty, I don't blame them for using that commercial service as an as a authentication. That's legitimate. However, what's not legitimate, because what is security? Security is protection, detection, and reaction. So maybe you have a method of protection that you know, you know what? That method of protection does not rely upon information that only the people had, like the only taxpayer had, because if only the taxpayer had it, we wouldn't have it. And then, you know, we, we're buying a commercial service, which that means the commercial service has it, which means they get it from other, you know, data sources from other people. However, that's a legitimate way of authenticating people, and perhaps that's one thing. However, the reality is, if you're sitting there seeing access attempts for U.S. taxpayers coming from Russian IP addresses, that might be a bad thing. 
that might be, you know what, there's a whole bunch of attempts all of a sudden at once. There's automated attempts. You know what, that's probably a bad thing. Because re protection might not be complete, because again, there's no such thing as perfect security. And you can build in something saying, look, security also has to be reasonable. Security also has to, you know, not preclude users from having easy access to their data. Because again, it's, it's interest. You know, users need to have relatively easy access. So what means is we're going to have reasonable protection, reasonable authentication, but then we're going to combine it with detection of misuse and abuse. That's where they failed. They used a commercial service that was, was primed for fraud, and they had no capability of detection backing it up. Preventing the target hack. Preventing the target hack, again, this is almost along the lines of saying, you know, don't put your password on TV, but having management that says, oh, all that data going out, oh, that, don't worry about that. That's kind of a bad thing. Warn vendors that they might get phishing messages, have better awareness programs for people, that's not necessarily in there. Segment your business networks from your vendor networks. Again, it's embarrassing to have to say something like that, but way too many companies have flat networks and stuff. And even the 90, and even the FBI believes 90% of you are completely clueless or work for clueless organizations. <laughs> Monitor the configuration of your systems and stuff like that to ensure what there is. Whitelisting, better monitoring of networks, better data leak prevention, so that hey, what's all those hundred million credit cards doing going out of our network? Oh, I don't know. Maybe we'll look into that later. You know, we look into it once it's on the Wall Street Journal or something. Next, preventing the Sony attack. Multi-factor authentication for administrator accounts. That should be a no-brainer in any organization, but unfortunately most organizations do. Changing administrator passwords on a periodic basis. Honestly, have, uh, you can't prevent the administrators from reusing their personal passwords because it's hard to know unless you're being really obtrusive and intrusive as to whether or not the people are doing stuff like that but network monitoring for unusual activities on the Sony attack, because they should have seen a whole bunch of data go out. There was no data leak prevention, there was no network monitoring of a whole bunch of stuff and all that. So anyway, anti-malware tools in place. The, this malware that was used by the Dark Soul attacks should have been easily detectable on the Sony network, especially because Sony also apparently totally discounted what would be considered, to your benefit, threat intelligence, which told Sony, by the way, North Korea doesn't like you, you know? North Korea's kind of pissed, you know? And they're run by a lunatic dictator who's kind of pissed about a movie made of him. So you gotta go ahead and think, well, what's North Korea gonna do? Well, gee, they did all these nasty things to banks that they really had a gripe against, so maybe they'll do the same thing to us. But again, that's how you incorporate threat intelligence. Preventing the ISIS attacks, again, and totally embarrassing to say, do not put your passwords on TV. I don't know how many of you have the opportunity to do so, but should you ever get the opportunity to do so, do not put your passwords on TV. And, and I can keep drilling in multi-factor authentication. You know, just because somebody steals your passwords or whatever, multi-factor authentication would have probably banned everything like this. Uh, or probably prevented everything. <laughs> you know something, John? Here's my recommendation for a password to use here. Maybe for something of this nature. Oh, sorry. Maybe a little sophisticated. That would be more than sophisticated for the purpose. Because security has to be attainable. Security has to provide the functionality and should match the level of risk. I hope the level of risk for accessing a public Wi-Fi network is low and that you properly segment your network that should some malicious party actually figure this password out, they wouldn't get much further than hacking my iPhone at the moment. Same. Well, actually, I do not want them hacking my iPhone, so that's another thing. Okay, so anyway, better detection on the IRS. Again, IP analysis. Again, people accessing the IRS systems from Russia, probably not what you would th be thinking is normal traffic. Focus on misuse detection, because like I said, you cannot, security has to provide the functionality. And yes, maybe the functionality and the level of effort that you taxpayers need to go through should not be extensive, but in that case, they need to proactively determine misuse and abuse detection should be in place in a case like that. 
Okay, preventing the OPM hack, Joint Chiefs of Staff, and all that sort of stuff. I really don't care. You know, I really don't give a manure about, you know, zero day attacks. The reality of the situation is there's defense in depth. When you look at the OPM hack, even assuming there were zero day attacks involved, there should be multiple layers of security for a system that is that important. That's got to be critical to everything. Because you can't expect, there's no such thing as perfect security. But when you have something along the lines of data that is theoretically involved for people with classified systems. And let's take a look at this, because there's another factor involved. I worked for NSA. When I worked for NSA, there was a classified component called the Defense Security Service. And everything was classified in the Defense Security Service, and it was a completely different system than what OPM had. But what happened? They wanted to cut government budgets. They're like, oh, well, we have the OPM to manage background checks. We don't need this Defense Security Service anymore. So they went ahead and pretty much budgeted out the Defense Security Service and said, let's combine all the classified things on the unclassified things. So what enabled the OPM hacks was a decision 10 years ago or more to kill the Defense Security Service. Think about that. Too many times people are compromising budgets. The actual service compromise were on the Department of Interior Services. <laughs> Why was OPM using Department of Interior Services? Because it was cheap. I'm not kidding. It's like, who's the, oh, we got all this unused server state storage on, you know, over at Department of Interior. Let's use them. Is the Department of Interior satisfactory for protecting data of that stature? We don't care. It's cheap. And nobody cared because Congress likes to cut budgets without, you know, determining what the impact is. But either way, Again, defense in depth is somebody hit by a phishing message. Of just because you open up, just because somebody clicks on a phishing message, it doesn't mean you should run a program. Again, if somebody sends you a malicious, like for the RSA hack that happened, where um, like China was able to compromise the RSA secure ID tokens that were used um, to access defense contractors, if they would have run instead of the actual Microsoft Excel program, you would not have had the ability to run malicious macros and stuff like that. So again, there should be defense in depth that says even if there is a zero day, the zero day should not get you very far. And even def after defense in depth, let's look at de better detection. Why is somebody downloading the entire OPM database and shipping it off to China? That's probably a bad thing. So anyway, there should be proper detection in place. Operation Lotus Blossom, I'm not going to cover this, but um, you know, I gave this presentation in Singapore, and when I gave it in Singapore, nobody heard of this, which was the most devastating attack, because I, you know, I wanted to you know, say it's not a US-centric presentation, you know, because frankly, the attacks I'm talking about are coming from China, they're coming from North Korea, China, North Korea, Russia, and all these other Russian criminals are coming all over the place from different places. They're, they're attacking things all over the world, so even though these are US attacks, or US targeted attacks, these attacks are happening all over the place. So basically, this Operation Lotus Blossom was China or some other similar country, it really doesn't matter to me, you know, attacking Southeast Asian countries and stuff like that. And they were using a Microsoft Office vulnerability if you didn't have the latest version of Microsoft Office running. But similar things. Common threads, multi-factor authentication, network monitoring was not there, poor user awareness, et cetera, et cetera, I'm sure you can read. Okay, let's talk about a real sophisticated attack. How many people heard about the equation group? Few people, not many. Um, pretty much the equation group's NSA's um, tailored access operations. Those people are awesome. I mean, frankly, best use of taxpayer money you'd ever find. Um, so what do these people do? They have, for those, how many people heard of Stuxnet? Okay, if you haven't heard of Stuxnet, go home. But um, seriously, <laughs> Stuxnet pretty much is the opera, you know, took down the Iranian nuclear facilities. They went ahead and caused the centrifuges to spin out of control, air gapped, all that stuff. That was supposedly um, software that came out of the equation group. You know, you had a whole bunch of different things. They were so good, you know, that basically they intercepted machines that were going to be delivered and installed malware onto firmware, replaced the firmware so malware was embedded into the firmware. The software is apparently so good because this was this, um, disclosed by this Kaspers uh, Kaspersky group, which of course is a Russian security company. Um, but what they found was, well, the thing is, you don't really, even if you know it's there, you can't find it. And because this was out for 14 years, 
and nobody knew it was there for 14 years. Think about where computers have gone in 14 years and nobody's been able to find it in that long. You know, in reality, the OPM hack was detected after a year. You know, target hack was detected after three months. This has been going on for 14 years. And now, not only if you know it's there, you can't even find it, they're, they're talking about two-year research efforts to figure out how to detect it. That's really awesome. I mean, you gotta give credit to whoever invented this. And now it's been upgraded by the Dooku stuff. I don't know how many people read about Dooku in the news. Few people have, but Dooku was like latest for they were trying to break into systems for some trade negotiations like the Iranian stuff, and the press was reporting like, how dare NSA try to hack nuclear arms negotiations? Like, you know, that's kind of what NSA's there for. So get over that part of it. Um, anyway, what constitutes a sophisticated attack? Here's the thing, there was a ruling, Miller versus California Supreme Court ruling in 1977 that defined pornography, you know it when you see it. So there's the thing, you don't really, sophisticated attacks, most of them if you can't tell aren't sophisticated attacks. The reality of the thing is, it, you know, it's hard to figure out. You know, it's more the methods, not who, but how. You know, you know that's how you determine. APT attacks, advanced persistent threat, let's, let's look at that term. Let's break it down in, in reverse. What's a threat? A threat is who or what it's out to get you. Yes, a threat is appropriate. Are these people persistent? In other words, are, I mean, persistent these days means if you scan the network and you try password as a password and then you tried something else, you're apparently sophisticated. So these people are persistent. Are they advanced? Who knows? Again, these two could be an advanced persistent threat by definition. Why? Because <laughs> I've seen it at a security conference. They do detailed research and their security researches. Anyway, um, but you know it when you see it. But it's much easier to say what's not sophisticated. So anyway, there's the Irari rule. So my name's Ira, and lately I've been working with this woman, Ari, well, Araceli, who goes by Ari, because my name's Ira, so I go by Ira, because that's my name. Araceli goes by Ari, I don't have a clue why. But anyway, so we were joking around one day because we were sick of everything being called sophisticated, and that's where we came up with the concept, well, why is it sophisticated? And I'm like, why is it not sophisticated? It's like, well, because we say so. It's like, oh, well, let's make up rules on this stuff. Because Mandan can call anything successful because they feel like it and they're getting paid a million dollars to do it. Let's put some criteria. So we try to define criteria. And it's more like, and very appropriate for Iowa, you might be a redneck if. That was like the methodology this presentation came out of. But uh, yeah, I know, I love to endear myself to the local crowds. Um, but anyway. <laughs> Um, you know, it's not a sophisticated attack if, so we're going to go through that. Okay, it's not a sophisticated attack if you begin with a phishing message. If you're going to be there, you know, frankly, phishing messages are expected. There are so many ways to prevent phishing messages these days. Most phishing messages should not even get to the users. And if they get to the users, there's so many ways to block them. But again, it's stupidity is not a sophisticated attack. You know, again, what's a phishing message essentially doing? Let me ask you this question. How many of you in this room have clicked on a phishing message and suffered damage in the last three years? You personally. No, I mean, well, I, I'm guessing nobody's going to raise their hand. I, I mean, but seriously, though, most people, and most competent people, are not going to click on a phishing message. There was a study that came out that said only 5%, 5 of users caused 90% of damage. So yeah, there's some people who are out there, but one stupid user out of 20 should not cripple your network. And if one stupid user out of 20 cannot cripple your network, it's not a sophisticated attack, it's an unsophisticated security program. The malware you should have, you know, if the malware you should have been detectable, it's not a sophisticated attack. Again, with Sony, the so malware should have been detected. That's a given. You know, poor, again, failure to detect malware is a sign of poor sophistication of a security program. So it's a sign of an unsophisticated security program. Passwords were likely guessed. Again, La YouTube password is not a good password. I can guess La Twitter password is there to follow. So you got to go ahead and figure out if you can guess a password and there was poor, pa poor password management, it was not a sophisticated attack. User awareness exploited with a poor awareness program in place. And sorry to Jen, I, I apologize for not getting through this as much, but here's a critical factor. Most security awareness programs are not awareness programs. 
Most security awareness programs are training programs at best. Training, by definition, is providing people with a fixed body of knowledge, period. Maybe you test them on it. So what's the typical training? You show somebody, a, a, a CBT is computer-based training. You show somebody a video and says, a good password has eight or more characters. A good password has numbers, letters, and special characters. A good password, you know, is changed every 90 days. Then you get to the end of the thing. And what happens? You say, a good password. What's a sign of a good password? Should a good password have three or fewer characters? Should a good password have four to seven characters? Or should a good password have eight or more characters? The user clicks C, and it's like, congratulations, you're now security aware, download your, you know, click here to download your certificate. And that's what happens. That is the average security awareness program in most organizations. And let me tell, and frankly, oh, I forgot, some people also do phishing. Let me ask, how many people here do fishing? Or run fishing? Okay, so if you run a fishing program, what is the first thing you do to run the fishing program? I will tell you what you do, whether or not you know it. You open up, you whitelist the messages you're going to send, right? You automatically say, these fish, I know these phishing messages are going to be blocked, so I need to whitelist the messages I'm sending. So what's that basically saying? The messages you're sending would never reach the end user anyway. So you're training users how to detect messages they would never receive. That is 100% completely useless. And even if you have phishing that's more than useless, what are you doing? You're training them how to detect phishing messages, which is just one attack vector. Does nothing about password security, does nothing about you know, not letting tailgaters through, does nothing about safe web browsing, does nothing about any other security awareness discipline at all. So again, if you have rely on computer-based training or phishing, you have a training program at best, a waste of money at worst. Well, even worse than a waste of money because you get a false sense of security. So you need a comprehensive program that unfortunately for Jen I will not be covering today unless you get me later. Anyway, known vulnerabilities were exploited. When you look at most attacks out there, you're talking about outdated vulnerabilities. I briefly mentioned Operation Lotus Blossom. Operation Lotus Blossom took advantage of a widely known vulnerability in Microsoft Office. All these things, you know, systems that are not updated. The Heartbleed vulnerability. There was a study out that said a third of internet systems still have the Heartbleed vulnerability present, despite the fact it was plastered all over the news, despite the fact it was embedded everywhere. How many people, like Code Red and NIMDA, those were the most iconic versions out there. Um, how many people remember Code Red and NIMDA? Few of you. If you don't, look it up. Because what happened, soon after the September 11th attacks, you know, there was a vulnerability that came, or sorry, a new attack that came out, and CNN called me up and said, Ira, the FBI is going to release this press statement about this new vulnerability. Oh, sorry, well, first Code Red came out, and Code Red basically exploited a known vulnerability in um, SQL, Microsoft SQL Server, which was released three months before, caused about a billion dollars worth of damage. No, three billion dollars worth of damage. So it caused three billion dollars worth of damage, completely known vulnerability that all systems should have had patched. Then, September 11th happened, CNN calls me up, and I'm like, well, can you describe it to me? I go, it actually, you know, it was called NIMDA. I go, it actually sounds like Code Red. They're like, oh, well, it might be, but, you know, the FBI says it's terrorist related, so we're going to cover it. I'm like, okay. So, you know, so I'm like, excited, I'm going to be on CNN. Then they call me back two hours later, it's like the FBI came out and said it's not terrorist related, it's just a regular attack. I go, well, you know, this is for CNN financial news. I go, Code Red caused a billion dollars worth of damage, NIMDA went on to cause $750 million worth of damage. I go, don't you think this is a good financial story? They're like, it's not terrorist related, we're not covering it. But again, it was a widely known vulnerability six months later, so nine months out that should have been completely prevented. So, you know, again, Multi-factor authentication not in used on critical systems. Because users are going to eventually give up their password. A user giving up their password to a phishing message or anything else, or even if it's a guessable password, should not lead to damage because those are expected. That's why you have multi-factor authentication. It's available for free. Twitter, Yahoo, Google, give it away for free. And most companies don't have it turned on that use them. But anyway, you've got to stop password, reuse bad passwords, and all that stuff. But still, multi-factor authentication will stop 
99% of social engineering attacks that compromise identity and all that sort of stuff. And like I mentioned before, J.P. Morgan Chase came out and said, you know what? We screwed up. J.P. Morgan Chase said, if we had multi-factor authentication, we wouldn't have lost 70 million credit cards. Get out of, you know, was not in the news because they never claimed it was sophisticated. And then they arrested five people a couple weeks ago, I think it was. If, for those of you that track that, they arrested five people. They didn't make a big deal about three of them were Israeli and two of them were in the U.S. But still, it was like, oh my God, Israel attacked us. Oh, those two, sorry. I'll let them know the two last and remaining ones are here in Iowa. <laughs> they, they escaped from Israel. Anyway, passwords were hard-coded into the malware like the Sony attack. Again, that's an embarrassing statement, but minimally it demonstrates a lack of multi-factor authentication required on systems. Detection mechanisms ignored or not in place. Every organization, if you have anything substantial, should have intrusion detection or intrusion prevention in place. Data leak prevention should be there on critical systems. There should be network monitoring. If you're Sony and your movies are the most valuable things in the network, you kind of should be watching when terabytes worth of movies go out the door. You know, terabytes worth of movies, even on a broadband network, kind of takes a while. But you got to look for that. And if you're not looking for that, really, shame on you. It's really, really bad. And don't ignore warning signs like Target did. You know, it's, especially when your name's Target, you know, it's like you're kind of a target by default. You gotta be looking for it, it's a given. So poor network segmentation in place. You know, I mentioned Sony had this, I mentioned Target had this. There's also, for lack of a better term, there's a whole power in SCADA networks. One of the biggest problems with SCADA, industrial control networks and everything like that, is that all their industrial control networks and everything else are flat networks. And I gave a presentation about four or five years ago at RSA called How to Take Down the Power Grid. And then five federal agents randomly showed up by, at my house at different points in time. I kid you not. It was fun introducing them to my pet husky. He's like 100 pounds of just teeth, fur, and big you know, dog. And it was kind of funny watching him be friends. Like usually I would put him in his crate when people come over. But it's like fun because it's like huskies are really stupid animals. I mean they just look at guests as like... Is that person going to feed me? And like, they just stare at you and bother you until you feed them or you don't feed them or they get bored. And then so I just let my husky get his fur all over the FBI agent suit. It was kind of funny for me. I'm like, oh, just ignore him. He'll go away eventually. And he's like, still, yeah, okay. Um, anyway. But I'll introduce you to Bandit one day. Whatever. Yeah. Whatever, whatever keeps you preoccupied. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I just wanted to yell at the FBI. But the thing was, at the time, Ironically, and what I did was I highlighted that in my presentation that business networks were overlaid on control networks on power grid systems. And because if you send somebody a phishing message, and there, since the business networks are overlaid, because what we did was we sent spear phishing messages to people who we knew to have access to industrial control systems, they clicked on the phishing messages, we got control over their PCs, and pretty much we took control of like the systems that are running the power grid type of systems in some company. So anyway, but... The thing is, that's a critical thing. Poor network segmentation in place is going to take down the whole power grid. User, oh yeah, by the way, after the FBI was trying to, and like, the NRC were bothering me, it's like the government accounting office a month later put out a report saying the Tennessee Valley Authority had the exact same problem I highlighted when the NRC was trying to go around. They literally went to reports. We want to tell you why Ivor Winkler's statements are completely false. And then everybody was like, um, who's Ira Winkler and why are you even talking about him? It's like, well, we don't care. We want to tell you why it's false. And they're like, oh, and then I started hearing from him. It's like, it must be true because they're trying to discredit you. I'm like, oh, cool. Here's why it's true. So anyway, um, user accounts had access privileges. How many people, most companies give people, users, PCs with admin privileges by default? That's bad. You shouldn't do that. So anyway, you got to make sure that, you know, people have only necessary privileges. So in summary, here are the IRARI rules. And I'm not going to go ahead and rehash them because I'm almost running out of time or I'm over time or whatever. But either way, all these things are what we consider, if any of these things apply, well, I guess in this case, this is like written as it is a sophisticated attack because you, buy, you, know, you bypass all accounts, have minimum privileges, there was proper network segmentation in place and so on. But anyway, you can get these or get, you know, get my attention or whatever. Um, conclusions, 
The hype impacts our ability to do our jobs. When everybody's out there saying it's a sophisticated attack, it's like, oh, we couldn't just stop them. It's like, no, we could have. You know, our, you know, the IRS commissioner made his employees look like complete morons. You know, the IRS commissioner said, well, those people are smart. Those people have lots of money. But the IRS had much more, a much bigger budget than the criminals did. It doesn't matter. The people, and the IRS does have a lot of good, smart people who are being discredited because somebody didn't want to take a fall in Congress. So that's what you really got to need to look at. When you hear unsophistic, when you hear a sophisticated attack, I promise you, by default, go assume unsophisticated security program by default. Only rarely will you have it, and frankly, the only people these days who are really launching sophisticated attacks, lucky for, well, I don't know, I'm kind of happy as NSA these days. My China and Russia, potentially Iran, Iran is kind of, the thing about Iran, those people, if they get pissed off, they will do some really damaging things. China's not going to cause too much damage, Russia's not going to cause too much damage, but I promise you, Iran and North Korea will on a whim, but Iran is somebody we never hear of who has much more capability to cause damage than anybody else. And also, if you kind of piss off a criminal, that could also get you in trouble too, because they might not have a control. Snowden was another example. Snowden, frankly, is a traitor who just wanted to cause damage when he left. That was all it was. He released, and anybody who thinks otherwise, he disclosed two pieces of information that might have been for the common good. The rest of it just caused significant damage around the world to lots of people well beyond the U.S. Anyway, and people died, by the way. Oh yeah, so anyway, here is that. Oh yeah, go to the IRARI report. Um, we, interviewed, we, we just interviewed John McAfee for that. Um, well, it's on CSO Magazine, but we interviewed FBI director, we interviewed... Um, uh, Howard Schmidt, we're inter going to interview the Secretary of Homeland Security and all that sort of stuff. And then sometimes you see Ari and I going on and um, ranting about different topics like leave China alone. Despite the fact that it might seem like I hate China, what you can tell is, you know, I, the latest video that we put up is leave China alone. Because our opinion about China is frankly, China is doing exactly what they want. They hack the OPM congratulate them because they've attacked a viable intelligence target and we should be, again, have disdain for the people protecting us because it was an unsophisticated attack or taking advantage of an, it's an unsophisticated attack, taking advantage of an unsophisticated security program. Anyway, I'll stop and ask if there are questions. Did you, when you talk about capability of the Russians and Iranians or, or desire? To, to do damage. I mean, do the Russians and Chinese have the capability as the Iranians? Um, Russia and China probably have more ability than Iran does. Iran has more potential desire to cause damage and must let less of a filter. Whether or not people want to hear about we now, there's much less desire on Iran. And, and I'm not talking about just my own personal opinions, again, for the Irari report. We've interviewed a lot of government executives, smart people. We're interviewing General Hayden and did pre-interviews with him. General Hayden used to be the director of the CIA and NSA. And again, here's the problem with North Korea, oh, sorry, with Iran. If you keep all the sanctions on Iran, they have nothing to lose. That's the problem. When somebody has nothing to lose, it really doesn't matter. What are you going to do? Is the U.S. going to bomb Iran for a cyber attack? Probably not, unless it's really, really, you know, unless it actually causes massive physical casualty. They're not going to do that. So the incentive for Iran not to commit a devastating cyber attack is not as strong, you know, without some sort of, san you know, with sanctions in place as it would otherwise be. But yeah, Iran has a case. North Korea, they have nothing to lose. North Korea's foreign policy is literally create a provocation, get concessions, repeat. You know, it's like a shampoo bottle. Create provocations, get you know, get concessions, repeat. That's Iran's foreign policy. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Why is Syria pissed at you? Oh, it's a Syrian electronic arm. Well, I call them cockroaches because they are. Um, apparently, well, these women might, I mean, apparently calling somebody a cockroach is a grave offense in the Arab world, which I didn't know, but was later informed. I really couldn't care less. They, they are a grave offense to any computer people. But really, um, what happened was I called them a cockroach, and every time they tried to get me, I was too secure, so they hacked a third party. I mean, they hacked CNN, but, well, no, they hacked the Wall Street Journal because of me, like I care. They hacked BuzzFeed because of me, I don't. They hacked the RSA conference site because of me. That was actually, potentially, 
not a sophisticated attack, but a persistent attack. And, it, and they were so, and I even highlighted how stupid they were, because they could have literally created the greatest watery hole attack to the security profession, because a lot of security professionals go to the RSA conference website to log in so that they can go ahead and submit conference, um, sub, well, for conference submissions and everything. And instead of trying to get a great watery hole attack, all they did was they rerouted a JavaScript program to put up a GIF that's called me a cockroach. And I'm like, I'm telling you, by the time it was done, people were coming to me and saying, are you the Syrian Electronic Army? Because you're getting national news attention. It's like, you know, I once, and it's like, sorry, did the kid leave here yet? But uh, anyway, no. Um, let's just say I had um, the Syrian Electronic, I, I was talking to the editor of BuzzFeed. And the editor of BuzzFeed goes, okay, no offense, but who the F are you that these people are defacing all of my data to get back at you? I, they go, are you hacking us or is this somebody else? I go, I don't know. It's like, I go, honestly, I keep wanting to antagonize them just so that they keep giving me national, international publicity. You know, I mean, calling me a cockroach on Twitter, it's like everybody, I got like a hundred new friend requests in three days because of them. You know, I got, a, I got more Twitter followers because of them. I mean, I couldn't buy this if I wanted to. <laughs> well, actually, I guess I could, but that's a separate issue. Um, okay, he's trying to cut me off, but I, Oh. No, we need to move forward. But. Okay, well, anyway, if you have other questions, I'll stick around because I don't think it's in this room. Okay, bye. Thanks.